Good afternoon and welcome to United TV. My name is Kamal Erkin. Uh, today is Easter. Well, happy Easter, everyone. Um, so no winter lasts forever. So no spring skips its turn. So I guess every year we are going to have Easter. So happy Easter for those who are celebrating. So our guest today is uh, Melissa Miner brown uh, our state representative. She's going to join me and Melissa is now joining. And just so that we have it on the record, so it's I'm going to call her Mimi, and and if if I'm out of line, you can always ask me to call you uh, <laughs> Mrs. Uh, Brown, right? So how are you doing, first of all? I am great. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me, and you can call me Mimi. You have permission. <laughs> all right. Thank you. So uh, we have you once before, uh, last year, I believe, uh, you joined um and you do a lot of uh, health-related uh, bills, and uh, your a lot of activities are on the health-related uh, topics. So we want to kind of uh, discuss the uh, issues in Delaware related to healthcare, access to healthcare, and what uh, plans uh, the state has uh, as United Medical being the. Um, healthcare providers. So of course, we have a big role in what's being uh, uh, accessed to and how it's being accessed to. So I believe, you know, we have a pretty sp specific uh, and significant role in that. Uh, so if we can start uh, the current state of healthcare in uh, Delaware from the access standpoint. Can I just say terrible? Does that work? Um <laughs> It, it is, though. Um, and you can even look at the HRSA data, right? HRSA, um, in their report, it shows that uh, Kent and Sussex County are actually a um, healthcare professional and access shortage area. And Newcastle County is a partial shortage area. So our entire state is suffering right now in regards to healthcare access. Mm -hmm. um, so it's something that we really need to, to hone in on and make a priority to, and figure out what we're going to do to address it. We need, obviously, we need healthcare providers, right? We're definitely in a shortage there. Um, we were kind of already leaning towards a shortage. And then once COVID hit, um, it got worse. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're suffering in that space. Um, I know we, we have some provider um, loan repayment pro or grant programs, and, and we're doing more around that to make sure that we get more um, healthcare providers in our states, nurse, nurses and doctors, um, especially to work in some of those areas that really need it the most. Um, but we also need to work with our, our healthcare organizations and, and you know, from a bigger standpoint, see how they can also assist with ensuring that um, we have retention here in our state and, and with our, our schools. You know, we, we need to make sure that our schools are on board, our, our, our colleges in our state, um, University of Delaware, Delaware State, um, Hopefully we'll have a, a med school one day, hopefully very soon, because that's really important. And then and then looking at how we get those providers to actually stay in Delaware once we once we get them through school here. So, so go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, I guess one of the issues um, and just so that you um, I mean, we, we were able to discuss um, briefly what we do from our side. So other than our providers, uh, our physicians, uh, what they do as a direct patient care. From our central office, we have a care coordination team. Uh, we have nurses, we have uh, other uh, medical staff who are really helping. Um, and one of the difficulty is to get people uh, on board with what they need to do. People here is patients. So um, now, in on, I think on one hand, there's the issue of access on the other hand understanding that access and what that means to that individual so i guess that makes a huge difference um so is that something that we can actually take care of um like better educate people to understand what they have access to now access to healthcare like we always look at i guess what i'm trying to say is that when we say access to healthcare like, do they really, are they able to go to a physician's office or get what they need and all that? But do they even know what they have, especially with the Medicaid population being more than 30% right now in the state of Delaware? So do you do you think that there's something that can be done for those individuals to better understand what they have? 
So I think Delaware needs to really take a large focus on um, focusing on prevention, right? Because you're absolutely right. What exactly does access to healthcare mean? Does it mean that you may have hypertension and you kind of just live your life with hypertension? And then when you get a really bad headache or you're at the point where you need to go to the ER, you go to the ER. That's not, to me, that is not what should be happening, right? We're, and we see a lot of the super utilization of the ERs and mainly it's because people are not utilizing the primary care and the preventative measures like they should be. Mm -hmm. So it is important that we educate people on prevention, right? On managing their health care, on the importance of seeing your primary care provider as often as needed. Um, and, and people aren't doing that right now. So it's going to take a lot of community efforts. I know that we're doing some work around community health workers mm -hmm. um, because they are out there, boots on the ground, um, talking to people in the community and educating people on just prevention, right? And also connecting them to resources. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that some of the, the schools are doing this work too. Like at University of Delaware is in conversation to talk about a, um, a program for their nursing students, kind of embedding them in the supermarkets, in the libraries, in the pharmacies. Um, and this could be part of their, their clinical work, but it's just being in the community and just having conversations with people. I, I tend to do it often. I was actually in, um, I was in a dollar store on Lee Boulevard and um, this person was in front of me in line and he had a whole, the whole belt was, it was um, the canned beef stews, the uh, ramen noodles, um, just a bunch of canned goods, processed foods, sodas. And um, I remember saying to this guy, cause it looked like he was going grocery shopping. And I said, are you grocery shopping just to have a conversation? And he said, yeah. And so we ended up talking more and our conversation went so well that I did find out that this man actually had a diagnosis of hypertension and diabetes. And so we talked a little more. And by the time I was done reading him the nutrition facts on that can of beef stew and then the um, ramen noodles, he actually didn't buy those items. And I told him, I said, you need to be connected with a cardiologist. You need to be connected with a, a primary care doctor and so that you and an endocrinologist so that you can understand the diagnosis that you have and possibly a nutritionist, right? Because he, he didn't know how to read a, a nutrition label. And so that right there is a problem when we have someone who has these diagnoses and they don't know that they can manage or how to manage their health care because that's the person that will end up in the emergency room, whether it's a heart attack, a stroke, or now needing some type of stent placement or or whatever. But and if and if that person is utilizing Medicaid, then that's a big cost driver right there. So as you were uh, telling me this story, um, I just want to make sure our audience knows that you are a healthcare provider, right? So you are a patient. <laughs> so like, we don't want people to go out there and then start diagnosing people, which I do once in a while, but you are actually, you're a nurse practitioner. I'm a nurse. I'm a nurse. But you did your master's in nursing, right? So I Yeah, so were... I have a master's in um, executive leadership. Okay. Yes. So, well, so you are qualified to make some of those diagnoses. So I just want to make sure that people don't misunderstand. So it would be nice if our representatives, they go out there and then start diagnosing people. I but know, right? And so, and for me, I just kind of do an assessment and then just start talking to people because I'm always wanting to educate the community. I've worked in the hospital and I've, I've seen how the ER can be utilized, you know, for, for, for so many things that can be managed outside of the hospital. So, you know, a... Uh, one of the terms that we see, um, uh, we we actually uh, start implementing early on is the social determinant of health. Um, I think STOH, we, we are going to call it shortly. So STOH is one of the um, uh, really key factor of understanding how we are delivering uh, the healthcare. Um, mm -hmm. Then also then you can actually look into the access side of it because what I have seen, um, from uh, different providers, uh, different, uh, as we do like different um, uh, case conferences. So, you know, every day uh, we have our team. So I run one team and uh, Donna Gunkel, our clinical uh, uh, director, um, 
she's running another team. We have four people, four nurses on each team, one social worker and one person from the business development. So uh, the team, uh, as we are going through these patients, like you look at the patient who's actually, uh, who's behind with their medication, uh, and then you realize that, okay, well, you call this person and then you find out that they are dealing with a lot of other issues. So it's like um, they may be taking care of their sick uh, mother uh, who just had surgery, or they may be taking care of their child who needs special um, attention. And then all of a sudden you realize that it's not just what uh, we are trying to tell them to do, but what was happening in their environment that time that day or during that uh, uh, time frame. So then it makes, makes it much uh, easier for me to understand we have to change how we are approaching this. Instead of just asking someone and telling someone, well, you are behind with your medication, or well, trying to understand why they will be behind. And social workers in that case, they mm -hmm. actually uh, bring a really uh, special element to the table where they are able to have some of these discussions in a better way than we do. Um, and then all of a sudden you start understanding there are a lot of other things, not healthcare related, but it's, it's in that person's life. So from the STOA standpoint, um, uh, how is how are we doing uh, at the state level? I actually really love that you talked about social determinants of health um, and just being able to take that holistic approach and understanding some like the whole aspect of a person's life mm -hmm. and, and just social economics, everything that's involved. Um, so I serve as the chair of the uh, social determinants of health working group under the, now this is for, for uh, women and children, but it's under the Delaware Healthy Mom and Infant Consortium. And um, we're actually coming up at to, on the very end of a two-year pilot that we did. To, we started two years ago. Mm -hmm. um, I sat with my group when I first became the chair, and I said, "What do we? We need to come up with some priorities so that we can get something done that's tangible and actually has an impact on Delaware." And we came up with a bunch of priorities, but the number one was housing. Mm -hmm. um, so, because the, the group said, "Well, if we don't have stable housing. How can you really manage any other any of these other aspects in your life?" So, so we came up with a pilot program for 40 women. It was 40 pregnant, housing unstable women. Mm -hmm. And in this program, we offered these women housing, um, access to the OBGYN, uh, for, of course, because they were pregnant, um, behavioral health resources, because these women were housing unstable and most of them didn't have employment. And we wanted to make sure that by the end of this two-year pilot, we were able to get them to a point of stability because it is possible. Um, education, financial literacy, um, do, and oh, and a $1,000 stipend every month. We also gave them a $1,000 stipend on top of whatever they already had um, financially. And um, case managers mm -hmm. and community health workers. And so we followed these women for two years. And it just shows how when you offer a hand up and you really wrap your arms around someone and, and understand what they're going through in their life, every dynamic, and how you can really get them to a point of stability. And so, and we talk about like maternal health and mater maternal mortality. We didn't experience any of those complications with these women during this time. And um, we actually saw a 324% return on, on investment by the end of this pilot. These women are employed, they've had their babies, they are housed, they are stable, some are in school, some have completed a program like a phlebotomy program, one is in a program to be a nursing assistant, um, but all of these women have successfully gotten through this pilot and they are in such a better space than they were when they came in. And to, to just see that by putting all of those aspects in place, and you talk about that that full scope, that care model, mm -hmm. you can actually get someone to a point where they can sustain and and be okay and manage. So so that's something I wouldn't say on the state level. Well, we did it for a reason. We did this pilot for a reason because we had to show how we can move the needle to actually lift someone up out of poverty, get them to a point of stability get them to a point where they can manage their own health care and maintain employment. 
Um, and we needed to have that data to show that it really works when you, like you said before, take that holistic approach to address the social determinants that exist. You need housing, you need healthcare, you need education. Those are the three main things right there. It's and, the, and the, it's the whole picture is not just one, uh, you know, one element of those three, like, uh, like when you mentioned housing, you know, uh, I couldn't help but uh, think about uh, there's a group of patients we have that I never knew until we started doing the case conferences. These people are homeless. Hmm. I have almost 35, uh, Sean actually is in the room um, earlier. So we were kind of, uh, our start was a little bit um, not our normal start. So I, I was going to introduce him, but maybe we'll do that then. So, you know, when we look at our patients, um, as we are trying to get them, like, why are you going to the ED, um, uh, uh, like the hospital, rather than just calling or coming to the primary care's office? Well, then you find out the patient is homeless. Yeah. Then, uh, then again, the social worker uh, side of uh, our team, they're actually doing a really good job with those. But I wouldn't think that we, we had homeless uh, patients who, has, who have insurances. So like that's why maybe from the um, access standpoint, you know, when those, uh, especially in, like one thing is like in Delaware, Medicaid is one of the um, probably best programs in the country uh, in terms of insurances. So, mm -hmm. you know, I'm more on the independent side. I do criticize both parties a lot um, publicly and uh, off screen. So. But from the Medicaid standpoint, the program that we have for a long time is one of the best programs in the country. Now, the, the challenge is that population is increasing and can we actually keep doing what we are doing today with all those new people adding into the uh, system? That's a challenge. But then uh, I was thinking, like they, 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 instead of just being eligible for this insurance as Medicaid, they really need to, uh, we need to get them from that level, like at the signing level on the um, uh, enrollment level, so then they can actually start being managed instead of waiting until they get in trouble and then try to look for some um, some care from, like because they, they have primary care assigned to them and they don't know they have, they have a primary care. Again, the per person is homeless. So, and then I'm calling the person, just imagine like how kind of like, not so smart what we are doing in some cases. I'm calling the patient and saying that, like one of our nurses calling, hey, well, you go to the ER a lot. So we need to, you know, control that and then you need to start coming. And the guy is homeless. So that stops everything right there. Mm -hmm. So that it becomes like a meaningless conversation unless we have those uh, professionals, like social workers, uh, they come into the picture and then they start helping uh, and showing them different resources that we have statewide mm -hmm. uh, because they better understand uh, and they know those better. But um, there is a huge, uh, I think still there's a huge gap on the social determinant of health from practices to practice, uh, from patient to patient. They really don't maybe understand, uh, you know, these programs that we do, we have, as you know, uh, we have this at 2 p.m. and then I have uh, 3 p.m., uh, Bariatric Friday with uh, Dr. Erga, one of our uh, surgeons. And, you know, the goal is not to just uh, help those who are going through the program, but people who are dealing with uh, any type of um, like on the weight loss issues, uh, morbid obesity. And then we are pro providing a lot of education out there. How many people we are able to reach? That's, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's a question. But I think we, we have to keep trying. Um, so from, uh, I'm going to, uh, switch gears to the telemedicine. Now, uh, you know, I do ask these questions directly, uh, and then we didn't actually tell you what we were going to ask you. It was just the healthcare was a topic and because we are also friends, so I don't want to actually corner you too much, but uh, I am going <laughs> to, I'm going to put you on the spot. So is telemedicine staying for long-term? So is, is, is it our goal from the state level that we are going to keep telemedicine after we are done with the pandemic-related issues? Yes. Okay. How do you feel about that? How do I feel about it? Yeah. I feel good about it because 
Telemedicine is a huge tool. You know, um, with pandemic, it was a huge crisis for us. Um, but I try to see some silver lining in any type of trouble that we go through. And one of the uh, silver lining in that is overnight, we start using telemedicine. So people, physicians and patients who didn't want to use telemedicine, it was like, it was like magic overnight. Everyone started, like everyone knew what to do and everyone knew how to access to their cameras and this and that. In one week, we were like 95% telemedicine. So now, of course, um, unless we see some of our patients in person, uh, telemedicine is not uh, the replacement of actual visits. Uh, I, in fact, wrote an article uh, when telemedicine started and once we start kind of settling, um, there has to be certain standards. So because we don't want patients or physician offices to take advantage of what's available to us. Mm -hmm. So we don't want to compromise quality. So you ask me from uh, the come, I feel I feel good about it, but I also feel like there has to be some set standards so that we are able to keep the quality uh, so that it doesn't become like, oh, it's being um, taken advantage of and then we are going to shut down telemedicine. Because uh, I don't know uh, if your parents, are they with you? Yeah. Your, so, uh, you know, I have to be careful. So mm -hmm. my parents are 73 and 83. I don't mm -hmm. want them to go to a physician's office in the middle of the flu season. Right. It's something that can be done through telemedicine. Right. But there are times that we have to be in those offices, and that's how we can actually make those differences. And in many cases, like uh, for our uh, dietitians, uh, they do telemedicine, um, and that can be done 100% telemedicine. There's not necessarily you have to see them because you don't need to examine the patients. Uh, some specialties, it's, it's, a, it's a perfect fit, uh, and it's a great tool to eliminate some of those uh, compliance issues too, because with the chronic patients, so they need to be seen four or five times a year in some cases, but not all of them have to be in person. So mm -hmm. because of that, I think telemedicine is uh, really important. Uh, it should stay, but with uh, some set standards. So then, then we don't go down on quality. I agree a hundred percent. I think about when I have my telemedicine appointments and you know, I get the phone call first from the medical assistant and they're like, well, have you checked your blood pressure? What is it? But I have, you know, but I think about people who who really don't have access to those items. Right. And they they don't know what's going on. So I think um, I think it is convenient in some aspects. But you're right. There are times when I'm like, I, I want to go into the office. You know, I, I want to be touched by the doctor's hands. I, I need you to, to, to feel my lymph nodes. I need you to make sure I'm OK. <laughs> and then there's times when we can have this this video visit and it's just kind of like a check-in, this is what's going on. And um, and I think this is where the state comes in. Um, I, I mean, I don't want government to be in our business all the time, but mm -hmm. there is a absolute necessity when it comes to healthcare uh, and having those standards because everyone has different understandings. Mm -hmm. and, you know, they do um, however they understand and that becomes a problem. So, you know, this is not just one-sided. Like, we had some patients when telemedicine was available uh, from the beginning. Um, so, like, we used to get calls, uh, videos from, like, patient was in the shop, right? They were in Acme. They were in, they were driving. So, we were like, mm -hmm. hold on a minute, hold on a minute. So this is not, like, <laughs> this is not about just having, you know, video call with you. You need to be in a setting where yeah. we can actually talk to you. You can actually... Tell us what's happening. We can, it needs to be private and all that stuff. And and that's why I actually wrote an article because I was having issues one on the patient care side with the interactions, one on the business side too. Even with the uh, you know we stopped having all those in person calls. I mean in, in person meetings, and now we are doing tele meetings. But then people don't turn their cameras on. Yeah. I'm like, well, uh, at some point we start losing that connection uh, because mm -hmm. when there's uh, there's a lot of benefit of having certain things in person, but then now the alternative becomes like 
no camera is just like a phone call type of meeting. It's not the same effective meeting anymore. So uh, I actually started uh, having little, um, a little fight with some of the vendors who are not turning yeah. their our cameras always on. So like if it's if it's a telemedicine or telehealth or telemeeting business meeting, your camera needs to be on. So then uh, then we can see each other. We still have uh, eye contact. We still, I still know what you are doing if you are listening or not, right? So it would be. Um, like we don't want to compromise the quality, not just for healthcare, but also from the business side too. It's like that's why I have I have to put this um, uh, the ethics or the uh, the etiquette of uh, digital health at that time. Mm -hmm. So it's like three four years now, but um, telemedicine at the end of the day should stay. Um, now. Uh, what are the latest uh, bills that you are working on, healthcare-related ones? Ooh, let me think. What am I working on? I feel like there's so much going on. Um, every time I say I'm going to take a step back, <laughs> I can't <laughs> because something comes up and it needs to be fixed or addressed. So you have uh, well, one we, with colorectal cancer screen. I can help you a little bit. Yeah. So you had one with colorectal cancer screening uh, The uh, as the, well, Sean is helping us there. Thank you, Sean. So um, that's... Uh, oh, yeah, that's important. Yep. You, you need to educate where, where folks. Are you, where, yeah, where are you the co-sponsor for that? So, yeah, I, let me see. Is that for... Uh, yes, I believe I was the house the house sponsor or the health... Yeah, for um, colorectal cancer. Mm -hmm. and I you, believe so. I don't even remember. There's so much... Oh, and then kidney kidney month. That's another yeah, one. Kidney month. Um, uh -huh. So then... Uh, Oh, I'm a co-sponsor on Griffith's bill too, House Bill 340, right for the Family uh, Justice uh, Center. The primary care bill. Um, which one? The um, the is it uh, or is it the Senate bill? I gotta think of which well, one you're talking Brian, about. Brian, actually, that's the Senate bill, Brian Townsend. Might be Brian Townsend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so yeah, so I just did um, I just did I just expanded some dollar coverage for mm -hmm. because we did the Medicaid reimbursement for dollar care. But then we realize that sometimes women need additional support, um, actually women and men, um, beyond the um, beyond delivery. So we wanted to make sure that there we would allow for additional uh, visits for doula services beyond that point. Um, we are doing some expansion um, mm -hmm. for women's reproductive health services so that um, abortions are covered through Medicaid and private insurance. Um, what else are we doing? Let me think, let me think, let me think, let me think. Let's see, um, I'm working on some legislation for preceptors to receive um, reimbursement somehow because we have to improve the workforce. And so in order to get these students precepted, these um, APRN students, these physician assistant students, Mm -hmm. um, we need, we understand that because the, we're in a workforce shortage that you're already spread very thin. And, you know, I think that a little bit of reimbursement could probably go a long way. Um, what else are we doing? You know, it's so funny. I should have came here with a list of, of things I'm working on because I don't even know. <laughs> so now from the, uh, community health initiatives, um, are there certain partnerships that the state of Delaware is doing with the communities right now? Hmm. I'm sure there are, but I don't know what that is right now. Okay. So, um, like, I think that's something that we want, uh, you know, uh, maybe one of the issues with us uh, from United Medical ACO side, because we are labeled as uh, for-profit organizations, although we take care of the same uh, patients that those not-for-profit organizations do. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, you know, in some cases, uh, some of them can be part of the hospital systems, which mm -hmm. can be even more expensive to the taxpayers. Uh, unfortunately, when it comes to those um, uh, community health initiatives, in some cases, those organizations like us are not the first on the list. Uh, we have about 115,000 patients on primary care level. Mm -hmm. There are about 500,000 appointments just in Delaware every year that we go through. Mm -hmm. And that's a huge access. 
uh, from the uh, starting any type of initiatives with the um, with the public. So we want to do more, but I think this uh, for profit, uh, not for profit, becomes a problem. Uh, maybe that would be a follow up with uh, you and with your team that we can actually look into that in a different way because we are right now uh, number one uh, Medicare ACO in the state of Delaware out of four. These are public. Uh, number 17 uh, in the nation. So uh, this is kind of like, uh, this is one of the handicaps that we feel like every time there's something happening with the state partnership, they're like, well, you are not a, mm -hmm. uh, you are a for-profit organization. Now, one other thing with the access that's important is a physician shortage. Uh, as we have a physician shortage, we have nurse practitioners and physician assistants are coming into the picture. But are there, um, uh, and we have a J1 Conrad program uh, in Delaware for a long time. Uh, for those who may not know that program is, uh, wherever we have the shortage, physician shortage, we are able to have a physician who's foreign graduate. And then they have to serve there for three years. Um, mm. So uh, the, how do you actually see the physician shortage as an access issue for the future? Um, like coming up in, you know, in the next 10 years, this is going to be, become a bigger problem. Do you think anything can be done at the state level to help the shortage? Yeah, I think. And so this takes me right back to where I, I think everyone really needs to be at the round table. I think we need to have our, our providers at the table. I think we need to have our schools at the table. I think we need to have our hospital systems at the table. And we need to talk about what we can do to support this effort. Because you're right. It's already, we're already in a shortage. Mm -hmm. And and right now, if you, you can't even get an appointment, right? Like it might be a month or so out. And, and that's not good. Yeah. Um, but I go right back to what kind of incentives can we provide to keep people here? Because that's like I talked to I talked to an MD and we talked about um, living downstate, right? And it's expensive to live down by the beach, yeah. but that's where with that according to the HRSA data, Sussex County is in crisis right now. We need providers there. So how do we get providers here, and how do we keep them here? What does that incentive look like? I was looking at some things that were done in other states, mm -hmm. and. I saw where there were hospitals that would provide a stipend to um, primary doctors who would come in and um, and work, and they would provide a stipend for a year for their housing, mm -hmm. um, but they had to owe back a certain amount of years. Um, I've seen, I've seen so I've seen a lot happen where the the systems can come in and, and help to improve, and the schools too. The schools too can come in and help to improve the workforce. So in the state as well, I mean, we can, it could be a collaborative effort, but I think we shouldn't make a decision without having you all at the table so that we know which, the, what the path forward will be. You know, I'm, I'm here as a legislator. I don't have the answer, but I'm hoping, and that's why what you just said before you asked this question, you said, you know, we want to be at the table. We want to help. We're, we're doing all this work and we want to be, we want to partner. I think that's where we start. We start with having these conversations because what I'm going to say to you when next time you come visit me, I'm going to say, how can I help you? How, what do we need to do to improve the workforce here in Delaware? And you need to tell me. <laughs> I, no, no, I, and, I, and I, I'll get it done, but I need to know. <laughs> right. And that's actually, you know, one of, yeah, absolutely. that's one of the reasons that we are having these types of dialogues Um Again, another silver lining of the pandemic. If we didn't have a pandemic, we probably wouldn't have this type of a show uh, on a weekly basis. So, um, you know, like last Monday when I saw you, um, we we look at the room and then at least 15, 16 of the yeah. individuals who were on the, yeah. who were on the mm -hmm. show. Um, and that, you know, increasing the uh, awareness of what's going on and what's happening and from like right from the field. So this is these are the issues. But I think from the physician shortage, what surprises me a little bit is uh, like University of Delaware is one of the best uh, colleges in uh, in the um, United States. And I think uh, their also health care program, uh, their nursing program is really excellent. I think there's a lot of potentials that we can, we should have a medical school 
uh, with the partnership with UD, but um, I don't know if maybe there's someone already working on it and no one told us that I don't know, but uh, uh, one of the one of the other uh, goals for us is we want to bring the uh, president of UD uh, and then discuss certain things and then maybe we'll ask him uh, is it he or she right now, Sean? Uh, yeah. Dr. Dennis Asanis. So, right. so we'll ask him to see um, if there's any anything going on. Now, so you are not up for an election this year. so you, Yes, I'm up every uh, two years. Stress-free year for you. So, um, but never. A lot of It's never a stress-free year. <laughs> <laughs> so now, uh, do you want to make any prediction for the state level? So who's going to be our next governor? Oh, Bethany. All right. So who's going to be our uh, lieutenant governor? I, I don't know. There's there's three three amazing women running. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I I have in my mind who I who I think is going to be the next lieutenant governor, but I'm going to keep that quiet. So I guess we you know who the next Congress, I'm going to say who the next Congresswoman is going to be, right? So Sarah is going to be that person. That's what um, I'm hearing. But fine. we, I mean, we've got another candidate. Eugene Young is running also, but it sounds like Sarah is. Eugene Young, he's a really good guy. I like him a lot. Uh, he was on our show. Um, and, and I think he's putting a lot of effort now, uh, a little bit more than what uh, he did in the start. But I think Sarah has a. I mean, Sarah is the brand name in politics these days, so it's um, it's tough to beat her. But not because Eugene is not, uh, you know. Qualified. I know. I know exactly what you're saying. Yeah. Right. So like, it's, I wouldn't want to run against Sarah in any of these races. Me either. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Lisa Rochester was with us uh, last Thursday. Uh, so she's gonna be. She's gonna be our next. Um, senator um so it's going to be an interesting one but how, what about the uh, at the president level are we so you are a healthcare um so i shouldn't be doing this to you but i'm going to do it anyway so you're a healthcare provider uh, you're a nurse um you diagnose people while you're shopping so are you uh, do you think um joe biden can run for another four years yes so <laughs> I feel like I just gave you a politically correct answer. <laughs> so I don't know. I'm I'm just worried about him. So hopefully uh, he's doing okay health wise. So uh, anything uh, you would like to add before uh, we close the session? I think we had some really good um, conversation today. A really good dialogue. What I am going to ask is that after we we finish up here, we set up a, a date to get together and talk about how um, we can work together to improve access through, you know, just doing this work boots on the ground in the community. You said a lot of good things. And, and one thing you said was that your organization is, is not typically at the top of the priority list. And I know the work that you all are doing. So I would love to talk about that. And, and I also want to talk about, I want you to bring to the table some of your thoughts and suggestions around how to improve the workforce as well. Absolutely, absolutely. So uh, we'll be we'll be following up with you. Uh, Anthony Anubu uh, is our one of our directors here. Uh, he works on the contracting issue with me. Uh, Sean also works with me in these uh, for this program. So we'll definitely have a follow up with you. And we have a couple other items that we work with Brian Townsend anyway. So uh, it would be great to uh, you know bring certain issues directly to you and uh, see what we can do. Um, well, thank you so much. Uh, and I know this was kind of a short notice for you and that you were available today. Okay. Uh, we really appreciate uh, these uh, participations and we'll see you soon. Yes. Thank you for having me. Have a great weekend. Bye. All right. Well, Sean, do you want to join? Mm -hmm. yeah. So then people know that I'm not lying. You're here. I'm so uh, good conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Um... I think one of the things that, you know, you kind of just touched right there at the end, but um, the willingness for her to join on such a short notice. So we did run into her Monday night at mm -hmm. Valerie Longhurst um, campaign event. 
And just by, you know, bumping into her and bringing up the fact that she was on previous sessions, would love to have her back. Literally, you can attest to it, took out her phone, looked at her calendar, said she had the opening to be able to do it. Right. Just like that. Um, simple and as willing, you know, wasn't, oh, I'll have to get back to you or let me get in touch with my secretary or assistant and they'll reach out. And of course, I was, the willingness I thought really stood out That's true. for that. No, she's uh, she has a lot of energy and like with the nursing uh, nurse background, mm -hmm. uh, understanding the healthcare it's really important for uh, individuals to really know what's happening uh, from the provider standpoint. So I think she she can uh, do a lot of good stuff uh, for the state of Delaware. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so we have our bariatric Friday in fifteen minutes. Um, uh, next week uh, we have. So Robert Buccini. Yeah, Robert Buccini. Um, he'll be joining us. And then we also have uh, Governor Carney in the middle of April, mm -hmm. April the 19th. And Valerie Longhurst. Potentially on the 12th, waiting for the yeah, confirmation. 12th or the 26th. So we'll have uh, more coming up. So, um, all right. Well, uh, this Sunday is Easter. So yes, today's Happy Good Friday. Easter. Happy Easter Sunday. So we'll be back with the Bariatric Friday. There's a good Friday, there's a bariatric Friday. So then we'll, we'll be back with bariatric Friday in uh, 15 minutes. Uh, thank you for watching us.